Good afternoon, folks, and uh, welcome to the Autism Hour with uh, Miss Kimberly Howard from uh, Kentucky Autism Training Center. And uh, today's uh, session is going to be Executive Functioning and Emotional Regulation and Social Skills. Thank you for being with us and enjoy the session. Hey, guys. So this is probably going to be a two-part. We won't hit the social skills piece today. That'll be April's meeting, but today we're going to walk through emotional regulation. Um, I'm Kim Howard. I work for Kentucky Autism Training Center. Um, I know some of your names, so thank you for joining me. I know this is such a busy time of year. I hope it's spring break for you, or uh, or soon it will be spring break if you haven't had a chance to have your spring break yet. Um, in the chat, you're going to find a sign-in for KVEC that you need to do, as well as a resource folder that has today's PowerPoint, as well as some other goodies for you. Um, so check those out and we're gonna walk through executive functioning. All right, so what is executive functioning? Um, it is, we all need it, <laughs> right? If you made it here today, if you put this on a calendar and you made it here on time today, then you do have some executive functioning skills of your own. We all use these. Um, they are the things that get us the places that we need to go, hopefully on time. Uh, all of that falls into those. But it's a part of, it's a brain process, right? A cognitive process and mental skill sets that help us plan, monitor, and execute goals that we have created for ourselves, or maybe they're goals for others, but they help us get those things done. So your executive functioning system, uh, this PowerPoint was originally created by my previous coworker, Michelle Antle, and her husband flies airplanes. Um, and so she says that an air traffic control system uh, is very much, uh, your executive functioning skills are very much like an air traffic control system. So the air traffic control system's job are to keep all of the planes in the right places. It's to help the planes not hit each other, to land and take off at the right time. It's planning for, I have this many planes coming and this many planes going out. How many, how many lanes do I have for them to be safe? Our executive functioning skills helps our brain prioritize our task. So what's the most important thing that I need to be doing right now? Um, it helps us filter out distractions. It is 3.30 in the afternoon. If you're like me, your brain is tired and you have had a whole full day already. Um, so your executive functioning system gives you the power to persevere and to kind of keep going with what you need to do and to control impulses. This is the point in the day to where I want a snack. I am a food comforter. <laughs> and this is the point in the day where I'm like, I need some crunchy Cheetos or I need, I need some ice cream. No judgment. If you're having those, I totally intend to have some when this meeting is done and I move on to the next one at four 30. Um, but we all have executive functioning system and it helps our lives run smooth and for us to accomplish our goals and to get things done. Hopefully, if your executive functioning system is working well, a part of your executive functioning system are things like flexible attention. So flexible attention means that I, <laughs> there are many fires in the day, right? There are so many things that I could be paying attention to right now. Same thing for our students. They have multiple competing things that want their attention but my brain can help me select what's the most important task right now and then do that task. It also helps me maintain attention to that task. And then it allows us to switch. All right, math is finished. Now I need to move on to reading. Um, working memory is the ability to remember the information that we need right now and to pull things out of our working memory. And working memory is one of those things that... Um, one of those things that we all need and utilize, right? It's how come phone numbers are old, a long time ago <laughs> on old rotary phones when we had to memorize people's phone numbers, they were that many digits. Everyone's phone number could only be, um, what is it, seven digits plus the area code because that was about how many digits uh, we could keep in our working memory at a time, right? Um, so inhibitory, inhibition, right? The ability to have inhibitory control. Um, it's pausing and thinking before we act, or I tell kids it's stopping and thinking before we act. So why would we need to do that? Well, lots of times in the day, our brain shoots out things, <laughs> shoots out messages, or we have impulses that say, hey, I should 
eat an ice cream cone or, hey, I should punch that kid that just got on my nerves. Um, same thing for adults, right? We all have these moments to where we need to stop and think about how will this affect our long-term goals. It helps us to resist impulse. It keeps us on task, right? So it stops us from going down those rabbit trails that may pop up for us. Um, and it helps us set goals, long-term goals and carry them out. The interesting thing to know about executive functioning skills are we're not born with these skills. Someone has to teach them, right? And for typically developing kids, these develop really rapidly around that preschool age. So between three and five for typically developing kids, they're going to have a burst of development related to executive functioning skills. And then you get another spike of growth and knowledge for typically developing kids around your adolescent years. So late teen, early adult years, you're gonna get another growth. Here's something to know. No one, no one has fully developed executive functioning skills until the early 20s, right? So think about all those adult decisions that you made <laughs> in your early 20s that you're like, hmm, fully developed brain wasn't there yet. Um, I might have made a different choice if, if my brain had been a little more developed. And we know for students with disabilities, they're going to need scaffolding and they're going to need direct instruction in developing these executive functioning skills. Most of our typically developing students pick up executive functioning skills by watching and observing others and having a chance to function in a um, in a good classroom, right? For some of our kids, and especially the kids that we're talking about today, our kids with autism, our students with ADHD, our students that have had traumatic brain injuries, um, learning and behavior disorders, there's a lot of students that will have struggles with executive functioning skills. And there are a lot of adults that will have struggles with executive functioning skills. I'm gonna say that I had a terrible bout of COVID during COVID. And I could tell after COVID that it had affected my working memory. <laughs> I know that sounds, I know there's a lot of opinions on COVID and I don't wanna go down that path. But um, for me, it, it made my working memory wonky. Um, more wonky than normal. And I, my, my, my scaffold for myself is sticky notes. If you see me, you'll see my sticky notes. They're how I'm literally got my life stuck together with them. Um, but there's many things that we can do. So what can go wrong with our executive functioning skills? Well, think about yourself. Think about your students, um, the child matching their behavior to the task or the environment. Um, it's self-regulation is a part of executive functioning skills. So being able to be socially, to be socially appropriate and still be upset or be happy. Maybe it's a student who's really giggly. Um, being able to function in a lot of different environments, uh, but maintaining that socially accepted manner for whatever, what are the norms and expectations of that environment? It's being able to regulate. And I know we see a lot of students with and without disabilities that have issues with self-regulation. It's things like social skills. It's being able to interact with others um, and make friends and uh, work in small groups or large groups. All of those pieces can come into play for executive functioning skills. It's definitely can affect your academic performance. Um, we see this a lot with students that they can't find their work. They didn't do their work. I always think about this for long-term projects. Um, Many years ago, we used to do the science project. So the big science project that was a major part of your grade, but it's not due for six months out. It's all of those kids who are now doing the science project at 9 p.m. on the night before it's due, right? It's the parents that are out frantically looking for, you know, some piece of thing that they need and it's nine o'clock at night and it's due tomorrow. Um, academic uh, attention and concentration, it's being able to have sustained effort. Um, and to continue doing activities that you don't like or enjoy, because not all of life is enjoyable, right? We have to persevere and push through activities that we don't like uh, long enough to get the task done. So how do we know if a student has trouble with executive functioning skills? It is things like not being aware of the process of how things happened. Um, they may not have task initiation, so they don't get started on task. They live in the current moment. <laughs> They're not thinking about the future um, and they can't sometimes make the connection to their behavior 
and the consequence. So um, they get upset and uh, they're in, maybe they're in circle time, they get upset, they kick the child next to them and they don't seem to make the connection between their actions of kicking that student and then the loss of their break later in the day. Um, it's being able, it's many, many different things. So adapting to change, matching a strategy to a problem. Kids with executive functioning skills may have low self-esteem, low tolerance for failure. If they try um, and it seems hard, then they just quit because they are not in it. They, they aren't, don't have the capacity to be in it for the long haul, not without a lot of adaptations. Um, they may not see the big picture of certain tasks or situations. And they may need to be prompted to consider the feelings of others. And one of the big things that I see with kiddos that cannot self-regulate, then it's things like they are fine. You know, their self-regulation self is perfectly okay. And then it's not okay at all. They go from zero to 60 in, you know, two seconds. Um, so, so figuring out how to and some of these are developmentally appropriate, right? At different ages. Um, and executive functioning, as we've said, is something that you don't grow into fully until you're in your 20s. So all of the school years, um, students of every age and grade are learning this and coming and coming into their executive functioning skills. So things to know. So what does this look like in the classroom? So in the classroom, this looks like planning and prioritizing. They That's gonna be a challenge task completion is going to be hard, <laughs> sustained effort, recalling information that they've learned previously, um, knowing when to ask for help or to seek out information from others if they don't know something, being able to regulate alertness. It could be kids that are very sleepy from for a non-medication issue to kids that are um, on high alert all day long. Adapting to changes in the schedule or the environment may be difficult for them. So how does this impact our learning and our behavior? It's kiddos that struggle with things like listening to the teacher, right? How do we, how do we actually hear the words that the child says? So they may nod their head and, and appear to be listening to the teacher. But if you ask them to repeat what was said, um, then that might not be something that they can do. Um, keeping focus despite things going on around them, redirecting your own self back to task, being able to remember prior knowledge to complete an activity. So you worked on something yesterday or even a few hours ago and pulling that information back out um, and using it when you need to. It could be things like, how do I be in a, a small group in my classroom? Maybe today we're breaking out into reading groups or science groups, and that is going to be a challenge for some students. So think about the students that you know um, that may have issues with their executive functioning. And I will say, if you are um, a part of the IEP team, if you are a person who is responsible for helping to decide um, what type of testing you would do or a part of those um, like reevaluations or initial evaluations. If you're thinking that it is possibly a student with executive functioning issues, I like the brief. It's B-R, I think I-E-F, and it's there's the brief two out there. Um, it does a really nice job of pulling apart all of the different areas, which we'll look at in a few minutes of what are, what are the different areas of executive functionings. Um, and the nice thing about the brief is, is that it gives you suggestions of this child has problems with planning. Here are some IEP goals that you might consider. Um, it does a really nice job of helping you match and it gives you a lot of options that you can choose the right one for that student. And I think it goes from ages three, I think it goes through uh, most of, most or all of school age. So things to know about. So executive functioning deficits are strongly, are sometimes associated with diagnosis of ADHD, anxiety, schizophrenia, definitely autism, social communication disorder, Tourette's, um, learning disabilities. So you can see all of these on the screen. I won't read them, but many, they're a part of the diagnosis for many other disorders. Um, so it's highly likely that you have students in your classroom that have challenges with executive functioning.
And this PowerPoint is in that resource folder that Doug shared, if you would like to have it for later. There we go. And just on a note, you do not have to have a disability to have challenges with executive functioning. I will say as an adult, <laughs> I, I, I work with a large variety of people and I know my own self. I know that there are areas with executive functioning that are a challenge for me and that I, I so I scaffold for myself um, and I scaffold with some of my family members that these are areas that they struggle with. I've decided I'll never be on time again in my life, not because of myself, but from other family members um, and, and being able to get to places on time is a part of executive functioning. So why is this important? Why does it matter? So executive functioning is one of those brain skills that affect every area of our life. And if we, sometimes it's the missing piece. When we program for our students and we've put, you know, a lot of good evidence-based practices into place, we've put a lot of, they have a great robust IP, they have so many things into place, but something's not clicking some piece seems to be missing. This sometimes is the missing piece. We forget to come back and plan for and scaffold and teach the skills of executive functioning for our students. So task initiation, inhibition, um, we haven't, so shift is the ability to move from one activity to another. Planning is a part of executive functioning skills. Planning is one of those things that it lets us set those future days and goals. Um, it could just be, maybe I'm just planning out my day, or maybe I'm just planning how I'm going to get my homework done today, um, or planning how am I going to complete this worksheet that's in front of me right now. Um, maybe it's organization. <laughs> I have seen, I laugh because um, I live with some folks that struggle with this. Organization, it's your students that when they open their desk, if you say, hey, go get whatever, whatever, um, go get that paper, go get that book, go get whatever thing that you need right now to complete this task. When they open their desk or they open their backpack or their locker, um, things fall out and it is a mismatch of disorganization. They don't have the, the ability to keep their selves organized. So they're going to need some supports and help with that. It's the ability to self-monitor. So self-monitoring means that I'm watching my own behavior. I'm watching, I'm, I know here's, I know what my plan is. And so I'm watching myself to make sure that I can carry out my plan. Working memory is holding that information in your mind that I need right now to complete this task. So I don't forget what I'm doing. Um, and emotional control is huge. We've all worked with folks or have family members as adults that struggle with emotional control. Um, we've all met someone that um, struggles with that. And so executive functioning skills are critical skills that children will need as they grow into adulthood to carry out jobs and live their lives successfully. And we want these for everyone. All right. So something to know. Um, and I will say this comes from understood.org. If you've never heard of them, they are a great resource for many, many um many, many different areas of um, related to students with disabilities. So this comes from understood.org. Um, this is hot executive functioning skills versus cool. So hot, and I will say inside of, we're not gonna watch the marshmallow test. I don't have good success with playing videos on Zoom, but I put the video on a PowerPoint inside of that Google Drive that um, Doug and I have both shared with you later after this is done. And I know you'll never have time. It's about 10 minutes and it is, um, it's a really good video to watch that has a lot of information related to the classroom. So the marshmallow test is, it's been around for a long time, maybe since the fifties, maybe fifties or sixties. They give a three-year-old child, um, and this age varies a little bit across testing. Um, they give them an adult and they ask for help to solve a problem. And so the adult says you can have one marshmallow to eat now, or you can have four marshmallows if you wait, right? So all the kids tell the adult that they want to wait, right? They want to wait. And here it says candies and it's varied. It's been candies and marshmallows, but most of them are marshmallows. Um, 
on, <laughs> they say, all of the kids say, oh my gosh, I, I just have to wait for a couple, like, I think it's like one or two minutes. It's not very long. And so hot executive functioning skills are, they give the child one marshmallow and they have them sitting at a table with nothing but that one marshmallow and the adult leaves the room right? And they can see through a two-way mirror. The adult steps out of the room for about a minute or two. It's a very short amount of time. And then they leave the child with the marshmallow and have told them if they eat, if they want to, they can eat this one marshmallow now, or they can wait just a minute and then they will bring them back and they can have four total marshmallows, right? Here's what we know is that for most of the, for most of those kiddos, I'm trying to see if this is so why does this matter, right? For most of the kids, so the hot, the hot executive functioning skill is emotions are high, right? I have a marshmallow on the table in front of me. Um, and so now I'm faced with, do I eat this marshmallow right now? I have to use, I have to use my self-regulation skills. I have to use my planning skills, right? I got a plan. I want to wait just you know, a minute to get those four marshmallows. I have to use my pause and think. I have to use a lot of executive functioning skills to stop and not eat that marshmallows. <laughs> Here's what we found was that um, it's really easier to think about a stranger's choice than our own, right? Because we're not personally affected. A lot of those kids, it was a big challenge, right? For most of these three-year-olds, a lot of them ate the marshmallow immediately. Um, for the kids that did not eat it, uh, the kids that were able to pause and think they have cooler executive functioning skills, right? Um, they had the ability to pause and think that video will tell you that they did a follow-up survey with a lot of those kids, uh, like 20 or 25 years later. And what they found was students that the kids at three that were able to stop and think about that choice and plan out and wait for a minute or two before they ate that marshmallow and they were able to get access to the other three marshmallows, they had a much more successful outcomes. They were better able to manage their budget. They were better able to manage their um, home finances and their um, adult-based choices. So if you have time, uh, we won't play it here because Zoom does not like my videos, uh, but it's worth seeing. And it talks specifically about the classroom results. It's it's a little bit longer video, but um, if, if this is a topic you're interested in, go back and watch it uh, because it is very interesting. And if you think about that, hot executive functioning skills mean that um, in that moment, I have this marshmallow and I can't resist eating it. I'm going to eat it right now, right? Um, for the kids that had cool executive functioning skills, they were able to wait and um, to think about that and stay cool. So it's an interesting test. It's, it's been around for a while. All right, so we've talked a little bit through executive functioning skills, and I wanna give you some takeaways and things that you can use in your classroom and your school setting to um, help you scaffold and teach like how do we directly teach these skills for our students especially our students with disabilities that are going to need um going to need some supports uh, and direct services in place so one of the best things that you can do and one of my favorite things are play games right um, games gives us, especially for younger kids elementary age even middle school and high school there are some games uh, in here and any kind of game that teaches strategy, any kind of game that helps kids pause and think, any kind of games where kids are working cooperatively, cooperatively can't say that word today. Um, so any, has anybody ever played Spot It? Um, when I do this in person, we try all of these games out. Um, I'm gonna say that I really like some of them. We've probably all played Freeze Dance or Simon Says. Spot It is a game of being able to match pictures, but they don't look quite the same. So you're having to think kind of your brain is having to think there's a big fish and a little fish and they look the same. They are the same, but they're the size is different. So it, it it's matching with a twist. Um, other games that you can try is Blurt. Um, everybody's maybe played Scrabble or Pictionary. 
distraction. And it tells you on that list, like what executive functioning skills they are working on. Freeze. Jenga is a fun one, right? You're doing self-control. You're having to be flexible because maybe somebody pulled out the peg that you were going to pull next and you're having to do planning uh, and Jenga's perseverance, right? Because when you make it fall down, you have to rebuild it and then start over. Maybe it's brain teasers. Chess is a good one. If you have students that are a little bit older, um, chess can be, oh, I muted myself. Chess can be a great one um, to help you uh, do some planning and working on that working memory because you're trying to remember all of the moves ahead in your head. Sudoku, uh, which is a math and numbers game, if you've never seen that. And this, uh, the other one on the screen are play activities. And this is something that I put into that Google Drive for you. Um, you can go in there and look at that. It is a ton of, it's about, I think it's around 30 activities. And I want to tell you about Pathways to Success. Um, and that's the little, that's where that resource is from. You can Google them and look them up and they have hundreds of resources. Both of those actually are from Pathways to Success. That's their website on the screen. They have a lot of great resources, not only about executive functioning skills, but about social emotional learning, um, calm down type activities. They have a lot of great resources, some of which you need to pay for and some of which are free. So just a great resource, things to know. Um, the executive functioning play activities, you could pull those up on a smart board and do them with your whole class. It could be a center. One of the classrooms that I work with, they use those play activities as a center um, during, as their kids are in a rotation with an adult that are doing some of them, maybe not freeze, but there are some that are smaller in there, or you can do them whole class as a movement break uh, without kids realizing, right? They think it's fun. They think we're just playing a game. They don't realize, hey, we're actually, <laughs> we're trying to build up some executive functioning skills for you. Um, quite a few good examples in there of things that you could do for, with students to scaffold that. All right, so what do we do besides play games? Uh, so let's look at some more specific interventions. So things like visual supports. I can never say visual supports enough, right? If we're helping kids plan and organize and to be able to know what they need to do next, um, a schedule is a great place to start. Maybe it is a task analysis. Um, you're helping them break down. What are the things I need to do right now? So if you're giving them a task analysis of what are the things that I need to complete today, um, Maybe I'm trying to make a peanut butter sandwich. There's a lot of things that you can use a task analysis for to help kids break things down and to figure out what they need to be doing. I personally love visual schedules. If you have students that do not transition well, then they should have some type of visual schedule. Um, if you have students that cannot move from activity to activity, then that is 100% the intervention that needs to be in place for them. Maybe we're helping them think big. So we're looking at metacognition. How do I support metacognition? So I'm providing things like a graphic organizer. Um, this one in the left corner is something called the Freyer model, F-R-A-Y-E-R, -E mm, Freyer model. And I, I, it could be the way I'm saying it. <laughs> it's my accent, messing it up. Um, I like the Freyer model because you give them a definition, you give them the characteristics, you give them examples, and then you give them what it's not, right? It kind of gives them those what it's not. Maybe it's a checklist, like here in the middle, am I ha calm and happy? Am I ready to work? Am I getting, am I working? Am I not drawing? This is a student who's kind of struggling with drawing. So this is sort of a self-monitoring checklist. Am I all done? We've all seen uh, we've all seen these, the, a lot of these type of graphic organizers. Maybe we're giving kids a rubric. Um, I've asked them to write a sentence. <laughs> oh my goodness. The struggles of writing a sentence. I'll never forget my students who managed to write a sentence with two words or three words. And I had to be, <laughs> we had to be more specific. You know, what's, how long should the sentence be? How many words? Or maybe we're not there yet, but um, a sentence rubric might've came in a hundred percent helpful for them. Maybe it's so planning and being able to switch task and activities. So moving from task to task is a part of executive functioning skills. I know for our students with autism that 
it can be a huge challenge to transition and to move from one activity to the next. Um, that's something that I hear a lot about. I hear a lot from a lot of different people that this is a major struggle, getting kids to leave one activity and go on to the next. Um, even if it's an activity that they don't like sometimes, once they get there, they're there. Um, so getting them to move on. So doing things like utilizing countdown timers, um, the one in the upper right corner is a time timer. Uh, the red disappears. That's one of my favorites. Uh, I see lots of uses of sand timers out there or even just kitchen timers. I think whatever works right for your students, there are a ton of great apps that you can use on your phone or use on better yet, use on a school device um, to help kids count down. Doing things like warning kids when it's about, to, so I always do uh, a transition warning. So kind of telling kids before we need to transition, for my students, I would say, hey guys, all right, in two minutes, we're gonna move on to our next activity. Two minutes, guys, or maybe I gave a five minute warning and then I gave a two minute warning. That's one of those things you kind of have to decide what is most appropriate for your students. Anybody use a transition warning with their kids? I have a kindergarten teacher that rings a bell, a specific bell, like probably about two or three minutes before it's time to switch centers. So kids have a warning um, so they can start, so they can let their brain start processing out. I've got to stop what I'm doing now and move on to the next activity. We utilize things like a change card, which are on the left side of the screen. There's several options or a couple of options on the screen for that. Um, some people do a change card and it's a surprise. I always did a change card and I told my students what was coming. Um, maybe it's for a student that reads really well and you're just giving them a notice. Hey, this is what's going to be changed because of today, instead of going to, to the gym at, um, 9 30 in the morning, they are taking pictures. So we're going to have to go outside to the track. Um, right. Everybody has picture day. It messes up everyone's schedule. <laughs> Other transition supports. The pause button is one of my favorite activities. Anybody utilize the pause button out there? I really like the pause button. I think there are many good things that can come from the use of it. I've seen it be used as a transition support. Hey, we need to pause what we're doing now and we're going to go to lunch and then we can come back to it. Uh, pause seems to be much more effective for many of our students versus a stop. Uh, they a lot of our kids play video games or spend a lot of time on YouTube and technology-based things. So they are, they know what a pause is, right? They know what it means to pause something. The only caveat that I have is if you pause something, you have to be able to come back to it later that day. You know, maybe, hey guys, we're pausing this activity right now. We can come back to it at 2.30 at the end of the day, or we can come back to it at recess time, or we can come back to it whenever is appropriate. But if I pause it, I need to be able to unpause it probably during that school day, if at all possible, um, just depending on your student. But I've seen and heard a lot of good information about that pause button. And the cool thing about the pause button is you can print that off. I mean, that's just a Google image type thing. I can draw my own pause button. <laughs> Maybe you need to make it look like whatever your student, um, their pause is, like whatever device they're on, um, as similar as possible. Uh, but that pause button has been magical this year for some of the kids that I work with. So know that. Another thing that you can do is build consistent routines. If I'm trying to build an executive functioning support for my student, then consistent routines. So a routine are a routine is something like, what do I do when I arrive at school? So how I put my backpack up, I hang up my coat, I walk to my desk, and then we go to breakfast together. Or maybe at your school kids go to breakfast. They come in, they put their backpack up, and then they go to breakfast on their own. Some schools, they bring the breakfast to you, right? You get it, you come in. Um, hang your backpack up, put your, pull out the information that you need. Maybe they have a folder that they need to put in their desk. And then your cafeteria brings breakfast to you and they start their day before breakfast comes. Um, what are your consistent routines? We know for elementary classes, they spend 50% of the day in everyday routines. Routines like lining up, getting a drink of water, going to the restroom, how do I ask to sharpen my pencil? How do I get access to glue if I need it? 
Um, who do I ask for help? What's the routine for asking for help in this classroom? Um, there are, what's the end of the day routine, right? There's no stress like the end of the day routine. What's your car rider procedure at your school? Um, there are many different routines. So thinking through how do we teach them? How do we reteach them if kids are absent for more than a day or two? Um, maybe spring break is about to come up, right? Probably a lot of us are about to go on spring break in the next couple of weeks. When you come back from spring break, even though you've done those everyday routines all year long, you will have students that will not remember or be able to utilize them. So knowing about things like using visual supports to support consistent routines, um, using things like video modeling. I have a classroom that video modeled there. Um, she went over the course of several months she pulled apart, she wrote down a list of her everyday routines. And she had a group of kids that were her star students that did the routines really well. And she had permission from the parents and she kept them, um, you know, just a couple of minutes every now and then across several months. And so she, she recorded what is our center, you know, how, what's our routine for moving stations during center time? What's our routine for morning meeting? What's our routine for like several things? And she made a video that lasts about somewhere around seven or eight minutes that show almost all of her routines. And then she plays that video for kids at the beginning of the school year. She uses it during the school year. If she needs a minute or two to do something, <laughs> she puts on the routines video and it is TV with a purpose for those students. Um, it gives her a cushion and it's reminding those students. And then for some of her students that have, that need more cognitive supports, that meet, need more consistent reminders of the routines, they watch those routine videos on an iPad individually on their own uh, with the support of an adult to help them remember every Monday they watch the routines. Um, and then if they're absent, they watch the routines. Anytime they have more than a day break from school, they go back and watch those routines. It made a huge difference for her classroom. Um, and the nice thing is, is that once you've done that, unless your routines change, you don't need a new video, right? You can keep on using that for a long time and then you can pull pieces of it. Maybe you changed your center routine. Maybe you changed some other routine and you can just redo that piece and you don't need to redo all of it. Um, I have schools that the routines are the same across classrooms, um, across kindergarten, across first grade. And so they have develop their own visual supports or developed um, their own video modeling to show what they want it to look like. And they utilize the same video across classrooms. How do we provide choices? Um, providing students with choice is a great way to support executive functioning, um, scaffolding. I always say adult controlled choices are a great place to start. For some students, this could be things like, all right, we're about to work on this writing activity. Do you want to write with a purple pencil or the yellow pencil? Because for me as the adult, it doesn't matter as long as they actually write, you know, we can write with a pen, maybe, right? Maybe a pen's not a good choice. Um, thinking through what are some adult controlled choices that we can offer for our student. For some of our students, we're going to need to utilize things like a choice board and give them a more visually structured choice. Maybe their choices are during they've earned, they've worked and they've earned a break. So what do they want to do on their break? Maybe it's a choice of, I supported a student that had an autism diagnosis as well as an oppositional defiant diagnosis. And he was in, at that time, he was in the first grade classroom, full day in the right gen ed. And so he had a desk. He was a student that you could not give a direct instruction to because if you if you gave him, put him in the position of being able to say no, then, then that was what he said. And so he had two desks in the classroom and it was, all right, are you sitting on the left side or the right side? There was, we did a lot of providing choices for him um, and it made a huge difference. And it was, it took us a little bit of time to think through where are places that we could build in choices um, into our day, but it was a good support for him. How do we teach flexibility, right? We know for our students with autism that flexibility, sudden changes or being able to deal with things shifting from activity to activity can be very hard or being flexible in that, hey, we were about to start math, but now it's a fire drill or we were about to start math 
oh, but hey, surprise, today there's an assembly. We all know the end of the year is coming. Um, and hey, there's an assembly down the hall or at Christmas, you know, like that December season to where you have all these great plans and you know it's going to happen today. And then you get to school and um, there's 30 things going on. And so there's so much flexibility in some of those months of the school year. Um, giving kids a things like a wait card, you know, we're waiting right now. Uh, using power cards. So power cards are things like utilizing power cards are a part of social stories. Um, they're a, like cousins, right? Uh, power card utilizes something that a student likes. So it utilizes things like I had a student that very much like SpongeBob. So the power comes from the use of SpongeBob. So his power card said SpongeBob appreciates it when you wait or SpongeBob likes it when you wait. And a power card is generally very small, uh, something like the size of a baseball card, right? Um, and so if something happened and we were going to have to be, he was going to need to be flexible, especially in a surprise situation, we would pull out SpongeBob card and we would say, oh my goodness, SpongeBob appreciates it when you... Um, can wait or when you can be flexible and flexible might not be the right word, you know, some simplified version of that for that student to understand. Um, power cards can be utilized for a lot of different things, uh, but teaching flexibility is a good version of that. Um, flexibility is one of those hard ones, especially for our students with autism, uh, because there's comfort in that routine, right? Uh, we know the same things happen at the same day every time. And if the world is um, a scary place or a place that you don't always navigate well or understand how that is happening, then having some patience and giving kids some, some things like these visual scales um, and wait cards or a pause button, hey, um, will help support them through it. Teaching that self-regulation piece. I know we've done a couple of different episodes of this in different versions of um, self-regulation is huge, right? Being able to be a functional adult very much comes down to being able to have leveled emotionality, right? Being able to <laughs> navigate your own emotions um, and thought process thought processes and being able to avoid those rapid mood swings um, will be a huge help. So there's a lot of different strategies out there, having and teaching calming routines. If you have students that struggle with self-regulation, you should be teaching them calming routines. How do I calm myself down? So think about it for a second. How do you calm your own self down? When I first started teaching this, I'm like, well, I don't even know. How do I calm myself down? And then I thought through it. And today has been a pretty frazzled day for me. Um, so how do I calm myself down? Um, how do I ask for help? Those types of things. Teaching kids to recognize their triggers. And I will say for many of our students in the beginning, those recognizing triggers are going to be up to an adult. You're going to need to have an adult. If I have a student that has extensive support needs, then I have a list of their triggers. It's somebody's job in my classroom. <laughs> we keep a list of things and a trigger is something that makes them upset, right? So um, it's, and recognizing your own triggers. I always say that when I talk about this, but what triggers you, what makes you very upset and what makes your student very upset? Some triggers I can control. So I had a student that would be distraught if they saw a balloon. I know that's an odd trigger, but they had had a balloon pop, I think very near their face and it had been quite loud and it um, scared them. And so then thereafter <laughs> for several years, if they saw a balloon and this was before the era now, I don't believe they allow you to send balloons on Valentine's day or many schools do not allow balloons and things like that sent to the school during this era, that was not the case. And so I knew on those um, during that season, <laughs> <laughs> that I would have to be prepared um, and, and, and help them navigate dealing with that trigger because I couldn't, it was very likely that they would be exposed. Maybe the trigger is being told no. Maybe if I tell the student no, and that's a very common one. Maybe if I tell the student no, they are going to become really upset and be quite angry at me. Maybe I need to navigate. Um, do I need to say no differently? And I'm not actually using the word no. Maybe I need to say, well, here are your options. 
here are the things that I need you to do. <laughs> um, thinking through some of those. So triggers can be a variety of things. And that's very much going to be knowing your student. If this is a student with extensive support needs or a student that greatly struggles with self-regulation, then it definitely should be an adult's job in the beginning to keep a list of those triggers and figuring out ways to help navigate. And that's the other piece of this. In the beginning, calming routines are going to be prompted by an adult. Students are not going to be able to navigate these successfully right away. Even these breathing techniques that are on the screen, there's a lot of different breathing techniques out there. And breathing is one of the things that we tell kids to do, right? If you're upset, all right, guys, you need to take a deep breath. For many of our kids, they don't know how to take a deep breath. So for those kids, we do things like blow bubbles or blow the pinwheel. Um, there are some options out there, but thinking through how do we help kids navigate self-regulation and how do we teach and model that because you are the model <laughs> that's the other piece if I'm working with students that need self-regulation skills I am the the school the classroom adults are the model so I'm going to model some of those calming routines my own self for them um, maybe we're gonna I'm gonna pretend to be upset maybe I won't even need to pretend to be upset <laughs> maybe something will go wrong in the day and I will I will model using those calming routines, my own self as the functional adult in my classroom for those students, because it takes many years of watching other people be successful at navigating um, calming routines and self-regulation in order for students to be successful at it. So we have to start with adults as the model and then talking about it, you know, pointing out, pointing out um, characters in books um, through like children's literature. There's a lot of options that you can use, but direct instruction for calming routines, direct instruction for um, asking for help uh, and, and making sure that we give kids lots of options to practice that. And you have to teach these things when they are already calm, right? These have to be taught when the child are calm. Um, once they are already upset, that is probably not the time to teach it. So know those things. And I know that's things that we've talked about on here before. How do we teach impulse control? <laughs> this one is hard. <laughs> this one is hard for all of us at different points in the day. I will tell you personally, I have pretty good impulse control until I get exhausted or tired. Once I get really exhausted or tired, I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> then my response inhibition, my ability to tell myself, my personal self, no, it goes lower. Same thing for our kids, right? If I get tired, I'm having a bad day then my ability to be in control may tank over the course of the day. So we have to teach what are, what are the expected behaviors for, for this setting? Um, what are the expected behaviors for this classroom or for center time or for science lab? What are the expected behaviors during this routine right now? We have to have reinforcement systems. How are kids getting rewarded? for doing the things that we ask them to do. Some kids will do really well with social praise. I love the way you're sitting in your chair right now. You did such a great job listening to me. I, I really appreciate that, a pat on the back. Some kids are going to need an external reinforcement system. They are gonna need a reward. Maybe that's food-based, maybe that's access to gaming or like an iPad time, maybe that's a sticker. Um, reinforcement systems, can look like many different things. Um, and a lot of our students may need access to that. Have consistent, clear behavioral expectations across settings and across adults. And I say that because um, many of our classrooms, we work with multiple adults. So if I work in an MSD classroom, I might have two or one or five or seven other adults in my classroom with me. And it can be a real challenge to get everybody to agree what are, what are the rules, what are the expectations just across the adults and how are we enforcing these and how are we rewarding these? Um, so having things like the little sign on there that says when the playground time is over, we stop playing, we clean up, we get in line and we walk in the building and you can see the little dinosaur. Um, it says, um, and it's on the right side. It says to earn a dot. I will keep my hands to myself. 
So this is a student who's working to keep their hands to their self and they are working for a break. And I must, I don't know if they have to earn all of those dots. Maybe that's appropriate for that student. For many of our students, they're gonna need to earn, they're gonna need that reinforcement much faster. Um, so you see the first then board on there. So they're earning three checks. When they earn their three checks, then they're getting the then, which is hopefully something that that student likes a lot. Working memory. Uh, it's another area that may need to be scaffolded. And you can see my sticky note on there. <laughs> I completely utilize sticky notes. Um, it's fairly effective for myself. There are some great technology options, setting yourself a calendar reminder, um, utilizing even for our students, many of them, especially if we're talking about teens and older, older students, um, there's some really good options out there utilizing electronic systems that will support working memory. So setting calendar events. Um, one of the nicest things that uh, I took a research class um, in that research class, and it was one of those classes to where you had to research a problem and then put things into place and you know test out your theory. And it was over the course of about five months. And one of the nicest thing that that teacher did <laughs> for me was she broke down a very large research project into chunks. So she chunked it for me uh, and for the whole classroom. It was what she did for everybody. Uh, she chunked it and different parts of it were due over the course of the semester, right? So it wasn't all due at the end. It was due in pieces over the course of the semester. So if you work with students that are out there in gen ed dealing with some of those larger projects, set calendar reminders in their electronic system if you can. If you can to help them learn how to navigate their phone or their iPad, most, many of our students, even our, I'm, <laughs> I was in a classroom last week and the first graders all had their phone, you know, they, they had their phones out. Um, even our little guys have access to some of this sometimes using, utilizing things like color coding. So highlighting the important parts of information, visual cues. I have talked on here several times about um, the little cards at the bottom. That one says quiet, but there are many, those are for adults to give visual directions to students. Um, and there's a lot of different, uh, different words on there that you might say. Those come from a website called Victories the letter in autism. Um, it's a mom from Canada. They are freebies. She has a few different versions of them on there. And I always tell people, print the cards that you need. And I use these for words that I need to say a lot. So I had a student that um, liked to climb shelving. And so on my ring clip, it said feet on the floor because I can't be climbing on the shelf if my feet are on the floor. Um, so thinking about what are the things that I have to say in my setting over and over to my students, because if I'm having to repeat myself, I probably need a visual support because they, words disappear, right? Words disappear, but a visual stays to remind me of what that person just said. Even as an adult, <laughs> I need a visual support sometimes. Um, mnemonics. So PEMDAS, we've probably all heard of that. Um, this is how we break down larger math problems many good options out there. Sustained attention. So task analysis or chunking, breaking those tasks into smaller pieces. And this can be for a variety of tasks, uh, but chunking things, breaking tasks down into small steps and then teaching the small steps. All of this comes back to supporting executive functioning skills, reducing distractions. Maybe this is a student who needs to be in the back corner or in the front. Um, maybe this is a student who needs less clutter around them, helping students prioritize tasks and telling them why sometimes. So, hey, right now you should be working on your spelling because that's what we're doing next. Or remember we're taking, we're, we, are, we are going out to recess as soon as we're finished with this, helping kids prioritize tasks and helping kids to learn self-awareness and how having the ability to ask for breaks, especially if we're supporting students who have difficulty communicating, um, teaching kids we all need breaks uh, and we all need a way to get out of things sometimes. So lots and lots of options, um, lots of things to think through. So Doug, I'm gonna stop my share. I don't know if you have a sign out for them Oh, and I'm right at 425, so I, I'm not going long. I'm done. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions, but thank you so much. This was a quick 
run through. <laughs> I do have a feedback form that I am dropping right now, I think. Uh, yes. And uh, thank you, Ms. Kim, for the information. It was very, very helpful and beneficial. Uh, I was looking at, uh, of course, uh, the task analysis, breaking tasks down. There is a website called Goblin, G-O-B-L-I-N Tools, and it breaks things down so you don't have to. And it breaks things down step by step by step. I mean, even the step that it breaks down, it breaks it down into smaller steps. So that's a, that's a really cool uh, website that I found to, to be very useful for folks that need that. So uh, that's uh, awesome. Yes. And Miss Esther, thank you, Miss Esther. She just mentioned that uh, she needed uh, today's uh, uh, session. So thank you very much. And thanks everyone for signing in. And uh, Miss Kim, if you have any parting words. I'm all done. I'll hang on for a few minutes if anybody has questions. And I'm all done. I will say that um, just a notice that our training site applications for next year, um, if you want to partner and be a school with us that we support, they will come out for the month of April. So be watching for those. They'll go to your director of special ed. All right. Anyone have any questions? Thank you again, Ms. Kim, for being with us. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, uh, be safe, be kind, be exceptional. <laughs>